three. Good morning, everyone, and welcome from the FAA Aviation Safety Center at EAA Air Adventure Oshkosh 2019. Uh, my name is Mike Collins, I'm technical editor for AOPA Pilot Magazine, and I'll be the moderator for this morning's chat. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panelists. Starting on your left is uh, Joe Norris. Joe is EAA's flight training manager. He's a commercial pilot and flight instructor in both airplanes and helicopters. He is also an a and mechanic with inspection authorization. Uh, to his left is uh, 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 Jamal Wilson. Jamal is a portfolio manager in the FAA's Next Gen Program Office. Uh, to uh, my left is Rune Duke. Rune is AOPA's Senior Director of Government Affairs for Airspace and Air Traffic. He's been AOPA's ADSB representative for at least four years. It probably feels like longer. And then uh, at, at, on the far right is Jens Henning. Uh, Jens is the Vice President for Operations, Safety, and Security for GAMMA, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. He's also the co-chair of the ADSB Equip 2020 Working Group on General Aviation, and he's probably been involved in ADSB even longer than that. So, welcome everyone. Um, one of the first questions we've got, uh, the, uh, uh, well, let's, let's review a couple um, uh, of the basics first. Uh, first off, when does this ADSB thing kick in? I'll toss that to you, Jamal. So, as everyone knows, the mandate has been out for quite a while. The date is January 1st, 2020. And the mandate stipulates that everywhere that you would normally operate with a transponder and you have one single space today, ADSB top equipment will be required. And that date is firm, and there's no plans to shift it, so we might ship the base in there the pitch plans on that January 1st, 2020. Um, Joe, how about a quick review of the specific airspace where ADSB will be required in January? Sure. Um, as uh, Jamal said, if you think about it this way, think about where today you need uh, the transponder in the sea. If you uh, view that map as it stands today, that's the same airspace that you will need uh, ADSB to operate after the January 1st of So just think about it in terms of boat sea today, ADSB after January 1st. And uh, for folks who uh, are planning to equip or thinking about equipping and haven't gotten too far down the road, uh, the FAA has given us, uh, in general aviation, a couple of different technology options. Uh, again, so we'd like to talk a little bit about the data link choices that we have and what are the benefits uh, to general aviation. Yeah, thanks, Mike. There's uh, two pathways. One is uh, the 1090 pathway. It's basically a mode S transponder with ADSB added. The other option is the UAT option. Uh, that's a link for people to do ADSB. Uh, we see about one out of five aircraft are retaining the wrong transponder, adding in a UAT device. The UAT, whether you have it on in or out, you can also get the uh, leather um, Rune Yens mentioned the uh, ADSB uh, weather and traffic information. Is the ADSB inside of the equation required in the United States? Yeah, so uh, the ADSB component is the part that is an equipment incentive, largely for general aviation. One being TISB, which is for traffic. Traffic information service broadcast, and then the other is your weather and aeronautical information data. So that is called the FISB, the flight information service broadcast. Those are both ADSB in, both of those are not required, those are just incentives to get you to, to equip. And there are benefits of equipping with ADSB out to maximize your benefits of getting ADSB in. ADSB in is generally going to be uh, on your iPad, via some type of portable unit, or maybe even via installed uh, avionics. And with the uh, as the as the mandate has approached, uh, we've found some uh, uh, minor adjustments that had to had to be uh, uh, minor adjustments that have to be made uh, in in conjunction with uh, things that we're still learning about the system. One question that I've gotten a lot, I think Joe's gotten a lot of EAA as well, is what happens with my ADSB. Uh, if I fly, can I fly during GPS interference testing? What's, what's, we've got some new guidance on that, Jamal, you want to take that? So, typically, when you're in the NAS, uh, once you have an ADSB compliant solution, and you 
do your performance report, you know that it's working properly, you've done your due diligence, if there is a GPS interference or disruption or outage in the NAS, the FAA is not going to hold you accountable or responsible. And you're not going to get a nasty ground that says that you were somehow out of order for operating during that interference testing. That's a very important consideration for folks who are looking at an ADSB equipment solution to know that that is not something that you have to add to your cost check. Once you know that your system is operating appropriately, you've done your due diligence and you're good to go. Um, another uh, another issue that we became aware of last year, uh, 91225, the ADSB uh, rule requires that your ADSB, if installed, be turned on and operating all the time. Um, I'll toss this with Arun because I know Arun was very involved in it. The, uh, that was an operational challenge for the formation flying community. Uh, here at Oshkosh yesterday, there was a formation of what probably 50 T-34s. It was a massive formation. Very impressive. Um, but the, uh, Rune, do you want to talk about the challenge of ADSB in formation flight and what's changed there? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things with formation flying is the wing, uh, the wingmen generally are not squawking. So it's only the lead aircraft that has their transponder and ADSB on. Well, 91225 paragraph F, it said everyone must keep their system on at all times. So that was something we started to work with the FAA as well as all of the formation flying groups, including the EAA, Workers of America, FAST, FFI, all of the different groups. And just last week, the FAA did publish a direct final rule, an interim final rule, that stated um, when you're flying formation flights, you do not need to have your ADS be on, um, except for the lead aircraft. So that was very positive. It was a recognition of, hey, we got we got to revise the rule a little bit to make sure it's working in all cases, and primarily for the safety of flight, for the pilots, as well as um, not to distract controllers. When we have controllers um, looking at multiple aircraft in close proximity, alerts start to go off. So turning off those uh, wingman uh, ADSB systems uh, results in those alarms ceasing for air traffic control. So it's a positive change. Well, and one benefit there, uh, as we got into that situation, trying to find a solution, we found out that the formation community had technically been in violation of the transponder rules as well, and the, the uh, direct final rule that, that Rune mentioned solves both problems. So I think that's a wonderful thing for everybody in general aviation who does formation flying, whether it's for fun or for air shows or whatever. So, um, and then uh, uh, I'll toss this to you, Joe, because you probably heard as much about it as we have, if not more. The um, uh, when ADSB, especially in the first rebate, uh, people were going out and doing their performance tests for the rebate, and they were performing aerobatics. Um, not really recommended during the performance validation flight, but understandably with the position changes and stuff, they were failing the, the ADSB performance monitor test. What's the status on uh, ADSB? Can we do ADSB? Uh, can we do aerobatics in an ADSB equipped aircraft? Uh, yes, you can uh, do aerobatics in ADSB equipped aircraft. Um, there's going to be some guidance coming out in an advisory circular that's going to be released shortly by FAA. And what it's going to say in general terms is that if you are involved in aerobatics, that you're not going to be violated uh, for those equipment. Uh, disruptions that you get because of the rapid change in airspeed and, uh, and altitude that will cause a, an alarm or a, or a disconnect in the ADSB system. So, um, one question that uh, that we are getting a lot from pilots and aircraft owners is, uh, what happens if I wait to equip with ADSB out until after the January 1st, 2020 deadline? Yes, you want to talk about uh, about that? Yeah, I mean, the good news is we have about, the uh, last number I sold from the FAT last week was 93,000 aircraft equipped, so a very large bit of the vehicle we are expected to are going to equip, and uh, we've seen that pick up. So far, last year about 2,000 months, this year 4,000 months is equipped that we're seeing, so we, we're really getting this uh, good acceleration for the pandemic. When the New Year's Day comes around, if you stay outside the ADSB airspace, you will still be in a position to fly. So we expect some offers from us to not equip. We obviously want to see everybody equipped so we get the air-to-air -air benefits and the price of the business system. If you are not equipped at New Year's Day, stay out of ADSB airspace. And also, look at where you're flying. If you start to get into the airspace at Jamal and Joe discussed earlier, there's going to be equipment opportunities in 2020 and beyond as well. So there, there's a lot of 
Well, and that brings up another interesting question. What if uh, maybe you have an airplane that is on the ground in ADSB rural airspace? It's not equipped. Uh, maybe it's being restored or you know whatever. Uh, or you're based outside of rural airspace and you decide after January 1st of 2020 to equip. Um, how can I get that airplane in or out of ADSB rural airspace if it's not equipped? What choices do I have? Do I have any options to follow? Absolutely. So there is a paragraph in 91.225 that relates to that very topic. And in essence, you're going to call the controlling facility about an hour before the flight and state your intent. Now, it's an important thing to remember that there is no guarantee written into that rule that says that you will automatically get in. You want to state your intent, and if that facility can take you, if it's a lot of peak time or they have a bandwidth to support you, then you should expect an authorization to get into that airspace and operate accordingly. But it's, uh, I believe it's paragraph G in 91225 that talks specifically to that requirement. So that's something you want to take a look at if you're a non ads group up there and you want to get into controlled airspace. I'll just add on to that. I know this has been something we've been working on with the FAA, and they've talked about it a little bit. We're going to see a lot more guidance this fall, especially how you use the uh, web tool um, that's going to be uh, published for clients to make that request. It's called the Adapt tool. So expect in the fall a lot more information on that topic. The important thing is if you want routine access to rural airspace, you got to go. Uh, let me just clarify one thing because I think you might have said calling the facility, but that my understanding is for the, I think you could call for transponder access, but the ADSB is supposed to be web only, if, if I recall correctly. So just want to make sure everybody has that, uh, that little piece of data straight. So um, I'll just toss this one out to the panel because I think everybody's going to have a comment here. One of the uh, common questions is, what type of ADSB equipment should I should I install? Uh, Yen, you talked about the two different technologies, uh, and we want to have a real high level. Um, you know, who should look at what? It's one of those uh, words that I'm trying to read the past. <laughs> I always recommend people start looking at this. Take a look at what the configuration of the aircraft is today. If you have a mechanic that you work with, they may have an ADSB experience with some. The reason that you want to start looking at your aircraft, you want to figure out what's your plan transponder. Some of them have an upgrade path via USB. In some cases, you may want to have the UAT path if you want to retain that transponder. In some cases, if that transponder is going to work on the two, it may not be working the way you want to. ADSB, for all practical purposes, is a 21st century transponder system. So you may want to take the step just to make a swap down the mode S path go down the path of an ADSB and the ADSB. The second part of the conversation is, do you want to have this on ADSB? If they, uh, 10 years ago, took the big decision, they gave progressive steps when it comes to tablet use. So a lot of people are getting their ADSB on tablets, but here's a path that also depends on Want to add anything? I, I think the Yen's made a real good point is the fact that you really have to look at your particular situation, what type of aircraft you're flying, what airspace do you commonly fly in, and how often you need to access uh, the ADSB compliant airspace, and make your decision on that. You, know, you, you, you look at your aircraft, your flight habits, and your budget, and make sure that uh, you find a, a, a solution that, that meets all of those requirements. Where there's lots of different options, a lot, and lots of different price points. They just need to sit down and really do a good analysis of, of how you're going to use the airspace and the aircraft and make a decision based on that. Another component of that is, um, as we've been using ASB more and more and more aircraft equipment, learning all of the different uh, use cases, such as if you have to change your call sign regularly, um, all of those different capabilities come into, uh, into play. Mike Collins has written a large number of articles about all of those differences. We have a selector tool on AMPA's website. The FAA has great resources, um, all of our organizations do. So just make sure, uh, you know, if you're using your aircraft for different purposes, uh, make sure you understand how that would come to play with ADSB. And just to piggyback on that, as we just mentioned, the FAA's Equipment 2020 website does have a compliance tool where you can go in there and put in a couple of bits of information and help to match available solutions to what you're currently flying to help build your search down from 30 different units to maybe five or six you want to take a hard look at how to work with the well, and, and uh, let me just add one thing myself, kind of piggybacking on what Jens mentioned. Um, when you're looking at your aircraft, 
there's a lot of vintage, um, let's call them legacy transponders in the fleet. If you've got a King KT-76A, for example, or anything with Narco in the name, great transponder. They've been great transponders for 30 or 40 years. Parts are replacement parts are not available for them, so they're becoming essentially unserviceable. So if you're transponding, especially if you're not making, you're having trouble passing your inspection every other year, uh, that's a great time to uh, look at replacing your transponder with one of the Mode S solutions. Um, it might be a little more expensive hardware cost, uh, but the installation might be less, and you will end up with a future-proof solution. You won't have to look at replacing your transponder six months down the road. Say it's an easy installation, but if it's working there in the in the uh, panel that's loading out, so I just want to put it in the middle of the house. And there's a new KT series out there. There are upgrade tasks there for various levels of what they do. Just as a personal narrative, I raised my hand. I had a KT 76A, and there were several solutions that were essentially plug and play. And I narrowed my search plan and helped me make a solution that was very, very inexpensive from an install perspective. It's kind of balanced out the purchase cost and kind of balanced things out. Almost a big idea of the solution. Definitely something to consider. So our next question comes from our social media channels. Uh, do I have to have ground training for ADSB operations? Uh, the one thing I will add, though, when you do equip, uh, and if you've already equipped and haven't read your, uh, your, your instruction manual or your flight manual supplement, you really should do that. And one of the things that's changed for most of us who learned to fly a while ago, uh, the, the, the memory aid I always used was lights, camera, action. You taxi onto the runway, you turn the uh, landing tech, the landing light on, you turn the transponder to altitude. In the ADSB world, that's a no-no. You need to turn it to altitude the minute you power up your avionics so that it can acquire GPS position, everything can be synced. Um, I've seen uh, ADSB performance reports fail because the GPS was still syncing when the airplane took off. You'll, you'll take off and your first couple minutes of flight will not be uh, valid ADSB because of the uh, the, the system's not quite ready to go. So, so read your read your manuals, follow them, and you'll be fine. And that actually is a good uh, lead into my next question. I'll, I'll toss this one to you, Jamal. Um, how can I find out if my ADSB is working properly? Do I just ask the controller how my ADSB looks? So typically, transparency of option from a controller's perspective dictates that what they see is not necessarily going to be ADSB centric. They're going to see your contact and you're going to control you accordingly. But we do have a public facing ADSB performance report that you can access on our quick ADSB website. It's very, very simple. It's free. You put in your tail number and a couple of other pieces of information. And your email address is one of the last things that we ask for. And 15 to 20 minutes later in your inbox, you're going to have a performance report. It's fairly intuitive. It's broken out by data point that we look at to make sure that your operability is up to par. If everything is green, then you know that your system is good to go. If it's something that is out of whack, then it'll show up as red, and that gives you a specific point to go back to your installer and say, hey, this is a little bit out of a whack. Let's see if we can make an adjustment and get this back into compliance. And you can request that report as many times as you want. I do it for just to make sure the bike is working properly. What we suggest to people is that before you do take the plane in for an annual, go ahead and do the report. Make sure everything's up to par. If not, you've got something else to take to your mechanic and say adjust this while you're in there. If everything is good, then you don't have to worry about your transport. And, uh, uh, and one thing I'll say, it's a great system. Uh, I think they say 15 to 20 minutes, but I usually get a, a report back in three minutes or less. It's really quick. If you're here at EAA or Venture Oshkosh this week, come to the a AOPA. No, not AOPA. Come to the FAA Aviation Safety Center. There are folks from the ADSB program office who are happy to pull up your report while you wait. So uh, come by, visit them, find out how your ADSB is doing.
Um, the, um, uh, so with this, and I'll toss this to you, Rune, do I need to do a regular ADSB performance check like I have to get my transponder certified? No, you do not. You do not. Um, the requirement is you still have to have your mode C transponder if you're flying in that airspace. Same with ADSB, fine rule airspace, you've got to have ADSB. But unlike the transponder rule, there is no 24 month check. So once you install it, you're good to go. But as Jamal pointed out, best practice is make sure you're getting that paper report um, regularly just to make sure it's working. So another question from social media in the future, will ADSB? in ever become mandatory? I'll let Jamal start with that. Anybody else have thoughts? So the short answer is no. What we tout from inside the FAA out is ADSB out is the mandate and in is the benefit. And we touched on it a great deal earlier. Wealth of information that you're able to take advantage of when you satisfy the ADSB and equipment uh, inside. There's a number of different receivers you can choose from. And there's a number of different ways you can present that information to yourself. As far as the mandate on the FAA side, there's really no more mandate for ADS to be in. How does the mandate in the uh, And another question from social. If I'm renting a plane, does the person I went rent from have to or are they required to provide documentation that the aircraft a little audio enhancement of your DAA adventure experience here? Um, so if you're renting an airplane, does the owner have to provide documentation to the renter if the airplane is ADSB compliant? Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Okay. I'll toss it to Ruin and Jens. Well, there is no requirement, but I mean, as a pilot in command, you're responsible for that operation to make sure it's legal and compliant with all, all of the requirements. So yes, absolutely, as a renter. I would want to know what's in that aircraft, that it's compliant, that it's meeting all its, you know, 100 hour, 50 hour, all of those different requirements. This is just one more of those requirements. Make sure you have that information before you go out and fly. Also, make sure you know if the aircraft's ADSB uh, compliant before you fly in real airspace. After 2020, you could easily make that mistake and grab the wrong Cessna 172 and fly in the wrong airspace. So, so do, do your uh, due diligence and as piloting command, uh, take that responsibility. So uh, a couple more, uh, but one more question here. Um, uh, well, I guess we don't. Uh, yeah, I do have one more question here. Uh, the uh, we're going to take one more question. We know the background noise has gotten very challenging. It's making it hard for you all to hear us uh, at home or work or wherever you're listening. So uh, we're going to cut off after one more question. We're going to continue to answer your questions. Uh, use the hashtag, uh, hashtag equip me, and we will get to you in response to your questions on all the different channels. So um, uh, here's a, 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 a kind of timely, because we're getting a lot of questions about this. The um, FAA rebate uh, came back. They've given away all the rebates. Uh, rebates are are expiring that do not get claimed so the available rebates get released every Wednesday at what 1 p.m. why every Wednesday I'll pass that to you Jamal because you're closer to that decision than the rest of us it's simply a chance to kind of aggregate the one to go back into the hopper and Wednesday we're in the middle of the week is when a lot of people are most available one o'clock Eastern Standard Time is when this coast Central Time now the West this coast can all kind of jump on uh, it's imperative that you set your phone, set your calendar, set your reminder for a few minutes before 1 o'clock Eastern Time. So that as soon as 1 o'clock hits, you can put in information and start hitting the button because they go very, very fast. But there are folks that have come to us just in the last 24 hours since we've been here and said, I'm glad that you guys put those back into the hot I was able to hit it fast and get the rebate. So now I can go up for a solution and get a $500 back. I, I understand that most days they're gone within 5 or 10 minutes, if not faster. So. Anybody with party comments? All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, if you're at uh, EAA or Venture, come by the FAA Aviation Safety Center, find out about uh, what you need to know about ADSB, get a performance report, and uh, keep the questions coming with uh, hashtag equipment. Have a great day.